Let's go over a bunch of the more curious parts of the old hunters. Some of these insights are pretty significant, and some are just minor observations, but fact is, there's roughly 50 insights in this video, so make sure you keep an eye on that frenzy meter, yeah? Let's start with the Eye of a Blood Drunk Hunter. In the same way that the Tonsil Stone allows one amygdala to transport us to the Nightmare Frontier, the Eye allows another amygdala to transport us to the Hunter's Nightmare. I thought it was interesting to discover that the amygdala needs something related to the corresponding Nightmare Realm to transport us there. Next, the grave that connects the Hunter's Dream to the Hunter's Nightmare is also the grave we find the Old Hunter's Bone at in the Waking World. The Old Hunter's Bone allows our Hunter to learn the Lost Art of Quickening, which was a technique particular to the first Hunters, and indeed, many Hunters like Maria dash like this in the Hunter's Nightmare without use of the bone. Third, there's a deceased amygdala in the Nightmare, and as we discover this new realm, we learn that Nightmare Realms are almost certainly linked to one another. They all have Amygdala, they all have Winter Lanterns, uh, which are based off the doll in our dream. The ship masts in the Fishing Hamlet can be seen from the Nightmare Frontier, and you know, even the washed up corpse of Koz looks kind of similar to these things in the Nightmare Frontier. We're learning more and more about these Nightmare Realms, especially how they have a very real ability to shape events in the waking world. Next up, have you noticed that the old hunters all wear a garb with the same red cloth on the inside? Maria, German, their attire is consistent with the time that they're from, which I thought was a nice, subtle design touch. The description of the old hunter's gear also tells us that the people in this time were quite superstitious. For instance, they used to think that the beast blood crept up the right leg, hence they put a belt around the right trouser leg. As pointed out by a bunch of you in the first video, this might explain why German has a peg leg on his right. Some of you suggested that it might have been amputated in some outdated method of prevention. And German and his peg leg both are viewable in the trailer for the Old Hunters. Have a look here, you can just see his peg leg, which is curious because it doesn't just make it any Old Hunter wearing German's garb, it's German himself walking through the fishing hamlet here. It places German's character undeniably within the events that the Old Hunters depicts, and we'll go into a bit more depth on that later. For now though, look at the blood lickers you come across in the Blood River. I used to think that blood lickers were limited to Canehurst, as if there was some sort of strain of the old blood that created them, because they're so different to other beasts, but because they're here, it makes it more likely that blood lickers just appear where a lot of blood has to be present. The blood lickers in Canehurst, for example, they likely appeared when the big slaughter took place there, where the executioners wiped out all of the vile bloods and slaughtered them. These blood lickers would have fed on the corpses, but you know, years have passed since then, so all the blood lickers there are skinny and roaming for food when we encounter them, but the ones here in the nightmare in the blood river are fat and bloated. In the old hunters, there is a heavy concentration of items and NPCs related to the powder kegs. The gatling gun, the piercing rifle, the boom hammer, all of these are weapons that the Old Hunters use, and all of it is going to help a lot when we're putting together a timeline for the things that we see in this nightmare. Take Lawrence, for example. The fact that he appears in the nightmare on fire might be because this is how he died. Maybe he died to the Molotovs of the Powder Kegs. Maybe in the Purge of Old Yarnum, perhaps. Just speculation, of course. The Gatling Gun Hunter, who we find in the cave, is described by his weapon as being the youngest of Jura's three companions, and he's wielding a portable version of the Gatling Gun that Jura operates in Old Yarnum. Given his relationship to Jura, I find it really curious that he too seems to be protecting the beasts. Why else would he be standing at the entrance to the Dead End Cave, with his back turned to four or five deadly beasts hiding in the cave behind him? And we see this behaviour in the Sawspear Hunter of Old Yarnum as well, who I feel pretty comfortable now calling one of Jura's companions. When you reach Simon outside the first shortcut, you can actually just kill him here if you want his bowblade weapon as soon as possible, and 
Don't worry about the key he gives you later, it will appear in the spot that he usually gives it to you. Another NPC I should mention is Valta. If you crush five vermin and reload the area to acquire his helmet, his name and appearance will change to reflect that when you summon him. He becomes a helmetless Valta, the Beast Eater. His duties, apparently, have been passed down to you. In addition, your League stance also changes to have you place your hand in front of your heart. Before we start talking about Ludwig, do you remember this snail girl that fell from the sky? I'm sure a lot of you put together that she fell from the above water world above our heads that's not able to be seen from this perspective, and I even got a shot of her falling from a distance just to make sure that's where she's coming from. Someone pointed me to this video recorded by Reddit user Dr. Xanthine MD, who discovered that you can actually revive the snail girl using the Madara's whistle on her corpse. It must activate a part of the hitbox that's untouchable or something, because you can't damage her otherwise. Now, onto Ludwig. How many of you had this little blood corpse survive the fight? It's surprisingly difficult to keep him alive, and altogether pointless, really. He just chuckles to himself once the fight is over. And if you look closely at Ludwig, you do realize a few things. He has eyes on the inside of his little growth here, and he's also wearing what looks to be the Executioner's garb, and his Moonlight Greatsword is strapped to his back during Phase 1. It's really cool to see that he retains a bit of his humanity when he lays eyes upon it. If you leave Ludwig's head alive after talking to it and reload your game, you'll reappear to find that Simon put Ludwig out of his misery instead. There's an arrow through his eye. A couple of you guys in the first video pointed this out to me, and I thought it was really cool, but it was only after I watched a German Spies playthrough that I figured out how to get the most dialogue out of these characters, and you know that's interesting information for me since I need to record this dialogue. You should check out a German Spies playthrough, by the way. He's got, like, one of the most knowledgeable playthroughs of the DLC out there, and he uses some pretty overpowered techniques. Moving on past Ludwig, did you know that if you die outside the Bell Ringer's room, then he'll say this? Unending death awaits those who pry into the unknown. Up ahead, in the main cathedral chamber, we discover that the all-popular How to Pick Up Fair Maidens has been ordered in bulk by the folks in the Nightmare. It must have been recommended by German or something. One of these Fair Maidens here is dressed in white, and recites the same phrases that Vicar Amelia did. Logically, this is Amelia, and logically she entered the Nightmare after we killed her. She prays in a different location now, but she's still potentially praying at Lawrence's skull. Send the elevator up without you on it. Go underneath, and you'll find Lawrence's human skull and the church cannon. One of the coolest little details on the elevator is the surgery altar itself. Putting aside all of the symbolism involved when we insert eyes into the inside of the skull and ascend into the heavens, how many of you actually noticed that there is a beast underneath the table? I caught onto this when I read a tweet by Hellkite Drake, another uploader who you should check out. The beast under the table reminded him of the beast in the opening cutscene of Bloodborne when you get the blood transfusion, and I gotta agree, the whole scene here symbolizes, to me, that latent beasthood is always a threat lying in wait, but it's also something that the church awakened through their experiments. Worth noting, also, is the book, the bell, and this hat, mask thing that looks curiously like Willem's. Moving up to the research hall, let's take a look at these statues. It's getting to the point now where we can sort of notice these trends in Bloodborne's architecture, and I'm starting to see these hunched over shapes everywhere. These things in the fishing village, the fish men in the village, the alien statues in the cathedral, they really like this shape in Bloodborne. When we finally finish Adeline's questline, she shares the milkweed rune with us. On the Fextra Life wiki, someone has written that the inscription of the rune resembles the letters HP, which could be a reference to HP Lovecraft, whose work is clearly an inspiration for Bloodborne. In fact, the story of the fishing hamlet is incredibly similar to Lovecraft's horror novel, 
The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which a lot of people have pointed out to me in the third video's comment section. The plot details a secretive town, humanoid fishmen, and the notion of human sacrifice, so pretty similar. But speaking of great bodies of water in the fishing village, as pointed out by commenter Iskaral1, the word loch from loch shield means lake in Irish or Gaelic. And of course, this is all behind the giant clock tower that Maria guards. In an earlier video, we pointed out that the hands align to point to the Great Lake rune, but what about the other runes here? Well, there are a bunch of them, and some are missing, most are there, but there is one here that I don't recognize. It's this mass of squiggles, and there's not another rune in the game like this, right? The closest thing I can find are the clockwise runes, but even they don't have these shapes. And it's weird because FromSoft had a bunch of runes they could have used here, they didn't use all of them, so why put one here that doesn't exist in-game? It's just making me curious, thinking like, there's something we haven't found yet. And I should take this moment to point out that no one has found the level 3 guidance rune yet. The official DLC guide does tell us that it exists within the Depth 5 root chalice dungeons, so if you're one of the rare, rare people who enjoy doing the chalice dungeons, then get out there and find that rune. Let's move on to Maria. She's a really interesting character, with curious motivations and a fascinating background. The Rakuyo weapon she uses lists her as a distant relative to the Queen of Canehurst, and even the Evelyn pistol she uses is a pistol favoured by the Canehurst Knights. The Rakuyo we find in the well was her weapon that she allegedly threw away when she could stomach it no longer. It's a simple weapon, it's not a blood blade like the Chikage, but we do know that Maria gave into her thirst for blood, since she certainly fights with blood in the boss fight, and even the goblet beside her looks as if it had blood within it. There's also a picture beside her, but the glass is so shattered that it's almost impossible to make out what it is. There are a lot of other cool details with her. For example, the way she lets go of your hand here reminds me of the way you hold your hand up to the doll to level up. Only an honest death will cure you now, she says. And I take this to mean that only truly breaking your spirit in a fight against her will stop the hunter coming back. She also says, a corpse should be left well enough alone, which mightn't just be related to her, it could be in reference to the corpse of Koz at the end of the fishing hamlet. She is clearly aiming to protect this corpse, and must have had a huge amount of distaste for what the hunters did here, and for all the hunters coming through. Remember that grave that overlooks the corpse of Koz on the cliffside? The one with the lumen flower placed upon it. I'm almost certain that Maria placed this grave and flowers here, because she's done the same thing within the astral clock tower room for this coffin here, and also because the balcony key tells us that Maria hoped Adeline would find comfort in the faint breeze that carried the scent of flowers from the outside. So her use of flowers here is pretty well referenced. There's also this fairly rare thing that happened to me when I was practicing for the boss guide. Maria can stagger and repost you if you get hit by this specific double-bladed attack. It almost looks like she's holding you close and whispering something in your ear before she rips her fist out of your chest. When you do defeat Maria, take a look at her death animation. Twitter user Halman made the observation that it looks almost identical to Germans. Both characters reach towards the heavens before falling forward. After you kill Maria, you will also get this dialogue from the doll. Good hunter, this may sound strange, but have I somehow changed moments ago from some place, perhaps deep within? I sensed a liberation from heavy shackles. Not that I would know. How passing strange. <laughs> you can actually listen to all of the dialogues from the game on Moonlight Butterfly's channel, which will be in the description. There's a million things worth mentioning as soon as we enter the fishing hamlet. 
Most of these things, I found, revolve around the villager who walks towards you initially. He has the same models as most of the spellcasters in the village, and there's a lot of curious things to note about him. Firstly, you can't actually kill him, even when he appears to have no health left. All you can do is knock him down and feel bad about yourself as he struggles to pick himself up. Of course, not to be deterred, I promptly beast roared him off a cliff. No, never mind, he's still walking around down there, if you look closely. Moving on, he also reacts when you knock over the small pile of shells near him, which is interesting. And one of the oddest things I've found is that if you watch him all the way until one of the last piles of shells, then he'll actually start to cast a lightning spell as he steps over the shells. I don't know if this is a pathing error or something, it's weird. This could even be related to how some of the other lightning spellcasters seem to be casting lightning upon the other larger versions of these shells when you sneak up on them. Why they're casting lightning upon shells? I have no idea. Let me know in the comments below if you have. If you talk to him with the milkweed rune equipped, then he gives a ton more dialogue and he also gives you an arcane spell, as I've mentioned in another video. Also, by the way, did you know that this cauliflower head glows in the dark? When you kill the orphan in the ending cutscene, you hear this chant, which is likely spoken by the male villager at the start. But this dialogue, and the chanting in general, it isn't that unique. After you kill the orphan and the rain goes away, you can hear the chants of the voices in the huts more clearly. Here's what I think they're saying. Mother is dead, her baby taken. Of all the dialogue I strained my ears to hear, I feel like this is the most significant. The notion that the orphan of Koz was taken from the corpse is novel information in and of itself, and it follows that the hunters had something to gain from stealing the orphan. Three thirds of an umbilical cord, perhaps? I do have to do some more thinking on this, so we'll get back to it in another video. But at the very least, it explains why the villager at the start pleads for mercy upon the poor wizened child. It's because the child was taken. I would really love it if you guys went there and strained your ears to hear some of this stuff. I might be wrong, and you might discover something new for everybody to talk about, you know? Because who knows what else is hidden in this dialogue. You can hear their voices very clearly near the beheaded hanging man, which is the symbol of the hunters, and also the shape of a man whose blood has gone to his head, which seems pretty appropriate for the curse that was laid upon the hunters, if you ask me. I mean, they turn into beasts when the blood goes to their head, so... I wonder if the villagers themselves serve as inspiration for the alien-like statues in the Grand Cathedral. I always thought it was weird that the statues wielded these long harpoon-like spears, which are pretty much unique weapons to those in the fishing village. But not all of the fishmen in this village are wielding harpoons, though. Many have scraping tools that they use to dig through the mud, which explains the piles of these little orbs that I assume are eggs, and also the piles of the little shells, which are like little versions of the big shells that the snail girls crawl out of. Furthermore, you'd be wrong to assume that these light blue things are fish, 
They're quite clearly slug-like creatures when you look at them closely, and they're caught in nets, they're on the ground, they're in barrels, and most interestingly, I also found a slug being used as a candle here, which implies that they're flammable to an extent, and maybe that they can be used as fuel. I suppose that explains the flammable barrels around the area as well. Some of the stuff you can find by looking in depth at these things is pretty insane. Progressing a little further, I want to point out a tip that was suggested by many people in the third playthrough video. It's that, finally, there is a use for the Shaman's Bone Blade. If you're having trouble getting the Rakuyo, this is probably the way to do it. And finally, we get to the Orphan. Many people have pointed me towards a video by Aegon of Astora, who compared the cry of the orphan to the cry of German, and discovered that they are the same sound file, albeit slightly altered. Aegon has a bunch of great cinematic lore videos as well, so you should check them out in the description. But back to the orphan being related to German. There is a link here, for sure. For one, he's wielding a weapon that has the same sort of shape as German's scythe, and also, when you kill the orphan, the doll gives you this dialogue, undeniably linking German to the orphan somehow. Oh, good hunter. I can hear German sleeping. On any other night, he'd be restless. But on this night, he sounds so very calm. Perhaps something has eased his suffering. Oh, and one more thing. It's probably the most amazing thing that I've ever discovered. 